Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome to our next episode of Decoding AQ. With me this morning, uh, it's almost both of our mornings. It's just gone to the afternoon for me, but it's certainly morning for Patricia Bender in Maryland in the US. She is the president of Bailey and Bender. So welcome. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. <laughs> Great. So a little bit of background on Pat. She started her career in fashion and marketing. And then Pat spent a decade at IBM. She was a high performing sales and regional manager. In fact, in her first year with IBM, she achieved rookie of the year by selling 140% of quota and went on to claim top performance awards for the next 10 years, which was a rare accomplishment. And it, for four consecutive years, she was in the top 2% of performance at IBM and was honored with four Golden Circle Awards. In fact, her final year at IBM, Pat earned the Distinguished Award as the top sales representative in the country. I mean, wow. However, over the past 30 years, Pat has crafted and honed her unique ability in helping organizations around the world to increase their growth, their profitability, productivity by helping them hire, develop and retain top performing sales and leadership talent. And like many of us, we're shaped by our parents, and Pat is no different, uh, with hard work ethic uh, and some really core family values instilled from an early age. And I've had the pleasure to get to know Pat over the last three months, and she is a prolific contributor. And my first question, Pat, is how quickly can you type? I can type. I don't know, maybe 65 words a minute. I, I can't remember. It was a long time ago when my father sent me to the Baltimore Institute to learn typing and speed writing when I was 14. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, how not only the decisions that our parents make when we're young, ah, do this, or we've got a little bit of interest in something, whether it's in music, piano, or something they think, ah, you should do this because it's going to be helpful. And we go, oh, I'd much rather be out with my friends uh, during the summer. And you had to balance those things. If you've got some memories of perhaps some of your childhood, those moments of things that instilled your, your values or things that you use today. Can you give us just a little bit of a, a few highlights of some of those, Pat? Well, I had a great childhood. I, I mean, I had a great child. I remember a lot of friends now, they go, my childhood was terrible. I go, oh, mine was great. We just had so much fun. We went, my parents, I, start, I think we started taking swimming lessons when I was six. And I remember it was really cold and we went to Mega Vista Beach. We get on the bus early in the morning and it was really cold and we get that water and it wasn't the pool, it was the, it was the river. And then we were on the swim team and we would swim. We had swim practice eight in the morning, then five o'clock at night. So that was like, that was the routine for the summertime. And then we always had to be home by... Well, not a swim team, but dinner was always at five o'clock. So we could never be late for dinner. Never, ever, ever. And the conversation at the dinner table, my father sold insurance for Prudential Insurance Company. Conversation at the dinner table was all about sales, where he was in the list. It was always, it was always about working and sales. And he was a musician. He played the accordion. He was a musical genius. Now that you're asking me this question, my father had his first music job when he was 10 years old. My grandmother would carry his accordion on the streetcar and he would go play gigs. He was a, mu I mean, he was a musical genius. He was brilliant. And every time he would play, we would go on music jobs. It would make me cry. It just touched my heart so much. I remember when I was three years old, we were on a music job. We didn't go on music jobs very often, but we were on a music job. My father, and he not he played the accordion. People would say, can you play this? He'd go, how does it go? They'd sing the song and he'd play it just like that. And he could sing, he was really great. But I remember this time I was like three years old. He picked me up, put me on the picnic table and 
he taught me how to play a song. My sister's name is Susan. Susan used to go to the Baltimore Institute with me also. She's older. And the song was, if you knew Susie, if you knew Susie, like I knew Susie. And he had me perform when I was three years old. <laughs> do you still perform? Do you still play music now, Pat? I do. I play the piano. Mm -hmm. I don't really play the piano anymore. I used to play the piano. I played the, I started taking piano lessons when I was in second grade. And then I started teaching accordion lessons when I was in eighth grade. And then I started teaching piano lessons in high school, all the way through college, all the way through a couple of years of IBM. And I remember my boss said, you can't keep doing this because I'd leave at five o'clock to go home and teach piano lessons. And he says, you need to stay focused. You, you'll make so much more money if you just focus and be in sales. It was probably my first year when I stopped teaching piano lessons. And then my friend that's a priest, Father Joe, we went to his ordination. We went to his first mass and then he was assigned a parish in Baltimore in Pigtown. It's called St. Jerome's. He said, Pat, you do me a favor? I said, sure. He said, will you play the organ at church for one month until we find an organist? I said, sure. Well, that one month lasted for five years. And then when he was transferred to the next parish, I said, I quit. <laughs> Because I had, I would do one mass on Saturday and two masses on Sunday. It would just get so it would interfere with, I'm a boater. So it would interfere with my boating. I'd have to get off. The, I would have to get off the boat at four o'clock to race up to Baltimore. I still had my bathing suit on. I'd be in the choir loft and Joe, Father Joe would look up and go, oh my God. <laughs> I had, well, I had a cover up on top of my bathing suits, but, but now I have a different instrument and my new instrument is tap dancing. My tapping is my instrument. Is your next piece. And now you've, I've only known you a few months, Pat, and you strike me somebody has always got a packed agenda, always got lots of things. And even just listening to you describe about all the things that we can uh, do, all the things we take on. And then all the things we're offered to do and the opportunities we get. And life is sort of this balance and this journey of adaption through how do we spend our time? How do we focus our um, our life and our unique abilities? What was the moment? So, you know, if um, you're at IBM, you're top 2%, you're performing really well. What was the what was the trigger point? What were some of the events that happened that shifted you to go from a corporate in a highly successful role to then starting your own adventure. Just talk us through a little bit of that uh, that moment and what was happening, Pat. All right, the bug bit me. Well, it, all, it seems like everything always goes back to when I was in second grade. When I was in second grade, I don't know, I guess they ask these questions. What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. It's what I remember right now. But it's like, I don't know what I want to be. I either want to be a nun or a movie star or a water skier. So I said, I'll be a movie star and then I can star as a nun and I can be a water skier. <laughs> so fast forward, you know, I go through college and IBM. And as you mentioned, the 100% club. And I remember when I was interviewing at IBM, I said, I'm not really sure if I wanna work for IBM. I want to travel. I want to see the world. Maybe I'll be a flight attendant. Well, the area manager looked at me like, are you nuts? It's like, you're not sure if you want to work for IBM. I didn't know much about IBM. My fashion, my, I was in the world of fashion. That's all I cared about. And he said, we have something called the IBM 100% Club. You will travel and see the world. We go to the great, great locations, a great recognition that when I went to my first 100% Club, it was in Scottsdale, Arizona, and it blew me away blew me away we stayed at the camel back in and they had motivational speakers they hired a choreographer they had a full orchestra they had something called skit players and they would choose different salespeople to be part of the entertainment and when i saw these motivational speakers i i just i just froze in my tracks i said that's what I want to be. That's what I want to be. And I kept doing it year after year, seeing these motivational speakers. And the third year, which was really exciting, 
I was chosen to be a skit player. And we went to New York and we would rehearse for six weeks. Every weekend, we had a choreographer, we had a musical director, and then again, I'm entertaining and I'm singing. We, we had to audition, so my father had me, he said, you gotta do it in your key, so tell him to play it in your key. And we practiced, and my audition song was If You Knew Susie. So anyway, when I saw those motivational speakers, I said, that's what I wanna do, I wanna do that. And I remember, I said, I want to start my own business, and I remember, Bob's best friend, or Bob worked for IBM. Bob's best friend was the vice president. And I mean, I was doing very well in sales. I said, I want to be a motivational speaker. And his best friend is Ed Mosner. And Ed Mosner said, Pat, you can't be a motivational speaker. You have to have a track record. I said, fine, I'll go get a track record. <laughs> <laughs> my track record, my record was that's what drove me to be number one and then after that it's like okay it's time it's time to jump over because I made I made all this money for everybody else it's like I, I'm pretty well driven I like to make money <laughs> and that's what did it I took a risk and, and so I, seeing this opportunity of going ah as we discover and we learn and we have these different experiences it helps us mold uh, our vision of what our ambitions are. What do we want to become? And it's often, what have we seen? What have we experienced? What gets our heart racing? You know, what brings us joy? What brings us love? And what, what can we contribute in the world? And so was it a means to the end of, ah, that's how I can get a track record and I can then become a motivational speaker? And that sort of journey over those 30 years, at what point did you feel um, now, ah, have I got a new ambition? Is it the same? Is that what brings you most joy now is being a motivational speaker? Because you do so many things, Pat, in the realm of that business, from training to assessments to all sorts of things. So my question really is, um, do you still uh, get the same joy from being a motivational speaker as when you envisaged it? And what are maybe the best aspects of that in your in your current world, in your current role? Well, when I said I wanted to be a motivational speaker, I actually became a trainer. So I'm a motivational speaker that's a trainer. And I still love, love, love what I do. I love what I do. And it's like, I pinch myself, I go, and when Bob and I would do seminars, we traveled like all over the country, had a huge contract with IBM. And we worked really hard because we worked together. And we'd say, and we get paid for this? It's like, it's like getting paid for it is the icing on the cake. It's like, I love what I do. I probably didn't answer your question very well. <laughs> no, it's a perfect, it's perfect, you know, and we'll never work a day in our lives anymore if we love what we do, right? And if right. we can find that and craft it and hone it, what a beautiful way. And for many of those years, Bob, your late husband joined you for a lot of that, um, that period. And before we go into some of the, the story about your husband and pieces of, you know, a big adaption that you uh, went through, what were some of those stepping stones, as I say, from going from a corporate world, set your own piece up, getting contracts, getting those first few contracts? Um, what did you have to learn? What, what showed up for you that you didn't expect, maybe, in starting that business? Um, were any significant things that um, really come to your mind from, I'm in corporate, I'm doing well, I set this new thing up. What was different? What did you learn from that? That'd be just really interesting. Oh, I learned so much from that. First of all, I went from a salary. <laughs> and then I had my expenses. I mean, my expenses, everything was paid for. Then all of a sudden you start your own business. What I brought with me was a desire. But I, I had a desire to be a motivational speaker, but I had no idea how to do it. I just knew I wanted to do it. And the first thing that I did, which made sense, was to be in sales, to do sales training. I had no experience. My background, as you said, was textiles and marketing. I had no experience in training. 
And so the first thing I did was sales training and I re I, it's like I re-engineered what I knew, but it had, it made no sense. I mean, I'd go out and what did I know when I was in college? It was all lecture. So what did I do? Straight lecture. And what happened? <laughs> I'm bombed. I remember somebody, it was like, um, I think it was a, somebody had recommended me and I didn't really know what they needed, but I, I don't even, I can't remember where I flew. I, I, I might've gone to Florida. I can't remember. And I think it was a um, speaker's bureau and it did not turn out well because it was all straight lecture. And I kept doing it. You know, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over. People kept saying, just keep practicing, keep practicing. Well, I kept practicing, doing the same thing over and over again. Well, it was terrible. And I remember one day I said, oh, it had to have been five years. I mean, I was spinning my wheels, spinning my wheels. The business just didn't take off. I remember one day I went to Bob's office. I said, Bob, I saw something. It came across my desk, how to get adults enthusiastic, motivated, involved. I said, let me just take this seminar. I just, if I can, because people kept saying, you should go back, you should go back in sales. That's where you're great. You should just go back to IBM. That's where you're great. It's like, I had this drive. I want to start this business. I said, said Bob, let me just, I just want to take this seminar. And if that doesn't work, I'll go back and get a job. He said, okay. So I went, it was a two day seminar and it blew me away. And I had so much fun. I didn't really like school. Whenever I was in grade school, high school, I just really didn't like school. This was the first time in my life that I had fun, that I loved it. I came back and I said, Bob, and we were in his office. I go, look at this and look at this and look at this. And let me talk about this and let me talk about that. And then the person that I met, she is the most creative person I've ever met in my life. Her name is Michelle Deck. She was the one that was teaching the course. and. It was, we were involved and we were, it was interactive. She was teaching a course. This was in Baltimore and this was Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. She was off. And then Thursday, Friday, she was doing another course in DC. I signed up for that course. And I have this eye that I can really spot quality people. I can spot talent a mile away. And I remember going up to her because she had all these props I said, you should start your own business. She goes, start my own business. I go, I'm telling you, people were standing in line. You should start a business with what you do. She goes, I can't do that. I can't be in sales. I said, Michelle, you don't need to be in sales. They're standing in line coming up and talking to you about what you do. And so I wrote her a seven page letter and telling her all about how to start a business I'm because it she changed my life. I mean, totally changed my life. And I'll never forget this. So I write this seven page letter telling her how to start a business. And then in the meantime, I mean, I was spinning my wheels, spinning my wheels, spinning my wheels until that point. And then on June 8th, 1995, Bob and I were at the doctors. He wasn't really feeling well. He said, I felt kind of punky. So it was 3.30 in the afternoon. They found an aneurysm in his abdominal aorta. It was 12 centimeters pulsating on the table. And my uncle at the time was the chair. Well, he retired, but he was the chairman of the board of the Cleveland Clinic. He was a doctor. And I went out. It was 98 degrees. I went out to my car, used my cell phone. I said, they just found something. They just found an aneurysm in Bob. We went back into the office. My uncle talked to the doctor. He said, um, where are you thinking about having him do the surgery? And they're talking about these different things. And I hear my uncle saying, what's the mortality rate? Are you thinking about seven o'clock that night? 3.30, we find out he has an aneurysm. Seven o'clock that night, we're on a plane to the Cleveland Clinic. My uncle picked us up at the hospital. The next day, they're, in, <clears throat> they're examining Bob. My uncle found the best doctor in the world for Bob. And so he's saying, do you have any pain, Bob? Bob says, no, I don't have any pain. Bob never, ever complained about anything. 
And one o'clock, he couldn't eat. And one o'clock, we're finally eating. He said, I wish that they'd hurry up and do this surgery because I feel like this is ready to pop. Well, we were supposed to be back to meet with the doctor again. And he said, you know, he came out and he said, I found something. We're not going to worry about that. We're going to have the surgery. I said, well, Bob says he wishes that you'd hurry up and have the surgery because he feels like this aneurysm is going to pop. And this doctor, his eyes got really big. And Bob was really tall. His doctor was kind of short. And he said, why didn't he tell me? I said, because Bob's a minimizer. He will never put anybody out. He, he won't complain. He won't put anybody out. He said, we need to do this surgery right away. And he said, go downstairs. We've got to do an EKG, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, I'm going to get a room set up so that he can just be relaxed. 7.20 that night, they um, started surgery. And I was so worried that Bob was going to die on the operating table because my friend's father, three months prior, had died on the operating table. He was doing a kidney transplant and he died from the anesthesia. And I told him, I said, I'm so afraid. And when they're wheeling Bob in, I said, Bob, you've got to promise me. You've got to promise me that you're going to come back. He said, I promise you I will be back. 20 minutes to eight, they called and they said, okay, he made it through the anesthesia. And in the meantime, my father, my father had like a like another, I'd say more than a sixth sense. My father would, he communicated from above. Let's just put it that way. My father was getting ready to go on a music job. And he said, Pat, Bob's going to be all right. He said, the Lord from above told me he's going to be all right. But you got to, you have to, you have to pray. <clears throat> You've got to tell God a couple things. And he said, and I'm sending a rosary with your mother to meet you at the airport that was blessed by the Pope. You got to say the rosary. I've never said the rosary in my life. I said, okay. So I'm saying the rosary. I mean, here I am in the hospital saying the rosary in the, Bob's room. 20 minutes after 10, I'm saying the rosary. And this is the first time I've ever experienced this in my life. It goes now and at the hour of thy death, amen. It's like, they're going to take them, they're going to keep them. They're going to take them, they're going to keep them. I felt the blessed mother. I felt Jesus in the room. I said, please, 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 please don't take Bob. Give him 10 more years. Please give him 10 more years. I go, no, give him, give him 14 more years. Um, 10 minutes to one, they call. They go, we're sewing him up right now. 10 minutes after one, they go, this man is a miracle, man. He's talking. So he survived. And in the meantime, my uncle said, Pat, it's going to be like Bob was hit by a Mack truck and they've got to put all the pieces back together again. And come on, there's nothing we can do. Go home. We're going to go home. I stayed with my aunt and uncle. But I shut my business down for three months because when I was praying that night, I said, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll quit my job. I'll never. I used to go to church and pray for every single week. Please, please, God, <laughs> please help me get my business going. I said, I will never pray for my business again. Just please, please don't take Bob. So we got home. We were at the hospital for about a month and I shut the business down for three months to get Bob back up and running. He had to learn how to walk again and you know, get back. And at the time he was working for a mortgage, mortgage company. That was a pressure cooker of a business. They go, he can't go back into that business. And the whole goal was once I got the business stable, Bob would jump over. Well, at that time it took three months and the most amazing, it's interesting you're asking me this question right now because this is all flashing back. I had written Michelle this letter telling her all about, you know, how she can start a business. And I was telling her about Bob, how he had the aneurysm. She's also a nurse. And when she got to the end of the letter, she figured he died. And she was shocked that he didn't. Well, three months later, she's in D.C. and we meet and Bob gets to meet. And I go, Bob, let's just talk to Michelle. Let's just talk to Michelle so that she can take what we have, what I've, you know, created. 
and let her put her spin on it. Let's just hire her to do that. So we're talking to her and she goes, and I'm kind of shy, believe it or not. I was afraid to ask her. And Bob asked, he said, would you work with Patty? Because he used to always call me Patty. He said, can she fly down to New Orleans so that you can take what she has? And then she said, no problem. We can do it on the phone. And that's how the business took off. Michelle got inside my brain. She got inside Bob's brain. She redeveloped it. She has a master's in instructional design. She's brilliant. She's creative. And she said, just do what I say. Just trust me and it'll work. And the next job we had, it was with the United States government, United States Information Agency. And they had hired us to do something called mid-career planning. We have a, cho a course called Career Choices. And I have a crystal ball. So I showed my crystal ball. I used all the props. We hit a grand slam from there. It just took off. But I shut the business down for three months because Bob was so much more important than anything. It's interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Pat, where what are some of these things that when we look back, we can, you know, line up some of the dots of critical interventions, whether that was meeting an individual getting an approach that was different of a capability that you can't see for ourselves, you know, when we're too close to something or too close to a system, to a family and health uh, challenge to make us maybe reassess and relook and be open to different, open to a new approach, a new way. And I, I think a lot of people, whether they're facing an absolute critical moment from their own health or a loved one's health, or whether it's a career or role or their business that is facing a situation that requires new capabilities, requires new thinking, requires a significant change. But at what point are we prepared to step back or prepared to ask for help? You know, you talked about, I was a bit shy of asking for help and somebody else did it for you. So I'm, I'm interested, now, perhaps just fast forward to some of the organizations that you're working with at the moment, the context of accelerated change, they might have a, an inkling of a vision, but maybe struggling to how to get there. What have you seen that certain teams or certain leaders or organizations are doing to help deal with that situation where they might have a vision, but struggling to manifest it with everything that's moving or changing or happening around? What are you seeing that teams are doing really well? Well, what I'm seeing, it's hard for people. And they, like, I work with smaller teams. I work with all different types of organizations. When I'm thinking about one in particular, it's a small organization and it's, it's a really small organization. And the owner of this company is trying really hard and doing everything. Like she has different people that work with her. It's a small, it's a small company. She has different people working with her, but it's like, she's stuck and she just can't, she's not open because she's so stuck doing what she's doing, trying to survive versus thrive, be innovative because She's in the situation. Sometimes, you know, it's more like you play to protect versus you play to win. And right now she's in that play to protect. That's that's one particular one. And it's like, you have to wait. They have to be ready. You can't push people. You have to just be there. You have to be open. You have to do the best that you can to help them. But they're the ones that have to be ready when it's all said and done. It's true, isn't it? You know, it's the we have lots of different sayings, you know, you can lead a horse to water and all, all of these things. And, and it can often be quite emotionally draining and frustrating for somebody who deeply cares about your clients, team members, other people that you're working with who are facing challenges, but maybe they haven't reached that event or trigger point for them to make a significant shift or, or change. And so those those situations, you know, sometimes, yes, we have to wait. Are there areas where we can do certain things, where we can help them see different perspectives, where we can give them some opportunity to see 
new things or new avenues? And if so, where where might they start with you? Because you've generated over the course of your career lots of training, lots of insights. You've got new courses, new things that you've uh, learned over time. Um, tell me about a couple of those courses and how it might help somebody who perhaps is maybe feeling stuck or just trying to survive. All right. We always start. We have a registered trademark. It's called Awareness is Power. And we say the more aware you are, the more aware you will become. Bob and I put that quote together. And we say successful people, leaders have three things in common. The first is they have the power to see themselves, which means they know themselves inside out and backwards. They know their strengths, they know their limitations, and they've uncovered their blind spots. We all have blind spots. It's just hard to see. You can't you can't fix anything if you don't know you have a blind spot. So that's the first thing we do. Second piece is they have the power to see themselves with others, which means they're able to identify all the different behavioral styles. They're able to understand all the different behavioral styles. But the real key is they're able to appreciate what every single person brings to the team. Then the third piece is They've got the power to win in every single situation. How? Why? Because they're able to adapt their behavioral style to what the situation's calling for. So we do leadership development. We do team building. And we have an assessment tool, which is called Awareness is Power Leadership. And that talks about your behaviors. And we do that one whole day. People know themselves inside out and backwards. They, under, they start understanding the people on their teams. They start understanding, how do, how do they like me to communicate with them? How do they not like me to communicate with them? What do I need in order to perform at my optimum level? What is it that motivates me? I like to know, we all like, we're all motivated, but we're motivated for our reasons, nobody else's. So it's nice when the leader knows what the people on their team, how they're motivated. So, and then the second day we go deeper. We go into values, the deeper waters of human behavior. Values are why you do what you do. It's the underlying reason for everything that you do. It's the fuel for the fire. And when we do our team building, when we do our leadership, we talk about three things. We talk about trust. We talk about change. And we talk about attitude. And then we just go right into it. And I have everybody working. And it's all a sense of, big element of surprise. It's like, what's coming up next? It's really fun. The seminar is really fun. And then we do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So we'll take the we'll take the graphs, put them together, take the behaviors, take the values, put them together. And then action plan. I mean, it's a waste of time if you don't put it into action. Then you need 30 days to process. It's like learning a brand new language. You got to process it. Once you keep living it, you got to live it every single day. Then we have another course, which is called Personal Excellence, Leadership Excellence. We talk about the seven keys to success. We talk about health and energy, inner peace, loving relationships, financial freedom, goals and values, awareness, and personal fulfillment. We go into the subconscious. Your, there's no, your subconscious doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's imagined. We can reprogram your mind for success. And then we have another seminar. It's all phases, one, two, three. Then we have take action. So when we do team building, we have pre-measurements, we have post-measurements. So it's like, what makes up a team? We get them to tell us what makes up a team. I'm not gonna tell you what makes it up. They tell us. And then we measure and it's totally anonymous. So you're getting the real answers. Then we go back, we feed the data back. What is it? Where do you need to work on? Maybe it's communication, whatever it is. And then we just created this brand of course, which I'm so excited about. It's called Overcoming Obstacles, how to develop grit, mental toughness, resilience, and persistence. It's online, it's on our online academy. It's 16 different sessions and it starts with achieve your goals regardless of obstacles. Second session is called the seven common obstacles you're most likely to face and how to navigate through them. 
The third is fear, how to magically make it disappear. Did you know that if you can get rid of fear, most of the obstacles are going to take care of themselves. The fourth is just do it. The fifth is get your creative juices flowing. It just keeps going. Believe in yourself through toughest times. But the most exciting part of all, we just found this amazing tool, which is called the AQ Adaptability Profile, Adaptability Intelligence. And when I discovered your tool in December, I went, this is amazing because it measures every single thing that we have in our course. And when I saw my score, I was talking to Mike. I said, well, I don't really know what this score means, but <laughs> I said, I have no idea what it means. All I know is what I saw and I scored 98% in grit. And I go, well, I guess I do if I taught the course that I'm living in and like 91% in resilience and like 95% mindset. I was just like so excited. But now the whole, I have the whole package. It all fits together. So it goes back to the three things. You have the power to see yourself, which means you're able to identify, understand and appreciate the people that are different than you. You know your strengths, you know your limitations, you've uncovered your blind spots. And now you're able to adapt I mean, you've always been able to adapt, but we take adaptability to a whole nother level. Adaptability intelligence. It's And thank you for that. You know, I mean, we got to hang out and spend time together. You did both our level one and our level two professional certification. And it's a, it's an incredible experience, isn't it? Because it's it's uniquely personal to what is somebody going through? What is it they're trying to achieve? What do they already have? How do they integrate with it? So you've got decades of experience of lived experience and courses, programs that you evolved over time to look at how can we actually ensure that we're getting you know profitable growth, we're increasing productivity, we're developing people, we're human and heart centered, you know, we want it to have fun. Uh, all of these things that are uniquely part of your values and your approach. And then over time, we'll find new things that come across our desk. It might be a, an assessment, might be a piece of technology, might be a person, might be a, you know, a um, governmental shift. It could be a new regulation. Is that There's always going to be a shift in some way. And the opportunity for us is both the mindset that we approach to, you know, not be just our blinkers. No, it doesn't exist. It's not happening or in a total state of fear because it puts what we had at risk is how can we actually just dance and have this poetic relationship? And as we we come to I've got two other bits that I'd like to cover, Pat. And one of them is uh, in creating that course, there's a lot of people who are now realizing they've got to continually learn. And it's this balance of they want to learn things, but they also recognize they've got things that they can teach others. And it's this balance, isn't it, between all oh, a thirst for learning, continual learning. But then I also want to gift what have I learned in my career to others? And I'd, I'd like to just understand you talked about, hey, you were doing the same thing. You found somebody who was a great instructional designer, helped, you know, shift what you're doing when you came this time for your overcoming obstacles, what were some of the steps you took in creating that program is question one. Um, and then question two, if people are thinking, I've got this you know, idea, I wanna create it, Pat's given me some starting points to think about, but I've also got to learn some new things. What would you recommend people start to think about as the key essential skills that are, are coming up? So the first one is, how do you start thinking about helping educate others and train others? Because uh, you've been doing that a long time. And the, the second part is, what do you think people should be learning? So the two part for you, Pat. Oh, that's a tough question. How did I, how did I start this overcoming obstacles? First of all, I did not want to do it. I heard this voice from above. Pat, you're going to create this new course. I go, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I am not. I am not creating a brand new course. <clears throat> it's going to be virtual. No, it's not. <laughs> because this was all during COVID. This, was, this happened December of 2021. 
So around December 15th of 2021, I start writing this course, Overcoming Obstacles, How to Develop Grit, Mental Toughness, Resilience, and Persistence. My goal was to have it finished by December 31st. Well, I missed the goal by one day. January 1st, 2022. I'm on the beach in Miami Beach, writing on the beach, writing the last session, which is called success. Write your own story. So I'm writing, 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 writing my success story, taking me forward. Here I am going to be <clears throat> three years from now or one year from now. I can't remember. I wrote everything down. And then once again, I come back because I, I was writing most of, the, most of it. I started in my office. Then I went to Florida. We always go to Florida at the end of the year or I always go. And um, so I'm writing it in Florida because I really get my creative juices flowing when I'm there swimming, floating in the ocean, walking. And then I come back, I get Michelle involved again. So it's edit, 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 like six edits. And I mean, we spend hours and hours and hours on the phone together. I go, I, want, I need some good openings. I need some good closings. And she's just so creative and it launches on March 9th and this was amazing divine intervention the whole thing was divine intervention so uh, some people start they we start March 9th and it's virtual well I'm not used to I mean I've, I've done virtual I turned the whole seminar the leadership in action seminar two-day seminar virtual we did that for the pentagon but this is like, this is different. This is overcoming obstacles and it's virtual. People are coming in and it's very interactive. And then next thing you know, as I'm going through the course, more people are, are in the course. It's like, I was coming back from my tap class on Monday nights. I have tap class on Monday night. I get this phone call. Hey, Patty Cakes. Everybody has a nickname for me. What are you doing? I haven't talked to her in two years. It was Brooke. I met her maybe five years ago at a tap three year, three month or a three week tap program in New York. And um, she said, what are you doing? And I said, what's new? I haven't talked to her in two years. She said, I said, well, I just created this brand new course. We just started. It's called Overcoming Obstacles, How to Develop Grit, Mental Toughness and Persistence. She said, sign me up. She lives in California. I said, we started two. Next week is fear, how to magically make it disappear. Sign me up. So she, she, she arrives. So that it's more and more people. And we have the most amazing people in this class. We have an attorney. We have an attorney who is also an executive vice president of a bank. We have a three-year widow. We have um, a business owner, very successful business owner. And then we have um, somebody that works for Deloitte. We have somebody that I have had been in my seminar 10 years earlier, the Personal Excellence Seminar. She works for a large manufacturing company. She's gone up, up in the world. And so then Brooke shows up. She tapped on Madison Square Gardens. She's a choreographer. And then fast forward, I get this other text, Pat, I really need to talk to you. This is after I finished lesson nine. It was every single week for one hour. See, that was different because my seminars were always eight hours. And now all of a sudden it's one hour once a week. Like how can you get one hour in once a week? But you have to, you, we, have, we teach 118 strategies. So each week, the first week is achieve your goals regardless of obstacles. You just learn five strategies. Second week, you learn seven strategies. And so I get this call from Jody. And it's on a Thursday night. And he said, he's telling me what's going on. I said, Jody, you really need to be in this overcoming obstacle course. He goes, okay, sign me up. I said, well, you're a quick study. I've recorded everything so you can watch the recordings Try to at least see five so you can catch up because in session 10, we're going into a whole section on motivation. First one is called build your motivation. 
He watched six videos. Jody is a Broadway star. Jody is a singer, dancer, tap dancer. He wrote, developed, and produced a show called All Hands on Deck in Branson, Missouri. And he was on stage. He got off stage. They're an hour behind us. He got off stage at 12 o'clock, 10 minutes after 12. We started at one o'clock. So, if, you know, he's in his dressing room, still in his costume, signed in on our course. And he's, he's just so much fun. And he just fit in with everybody. He already knew everybody because he'd already seen the videos. And it's kind of like when you go back and you look at it, because that's what the course is now. You go back and you go, you, it's like a series and you know all the characters because everybody is different from all walks of life, but we all have obstacles. I don't know one person in this earth that doesn't have an obstacle. You have a small, you can have a medium, you can have a large, you can have a life-changing obstacle, you can have a humongous obstacle. We all have obstacles. And the, it's just wonderful because you have 118 strategies to help you get through these obstacles. So, and I guess that's kind of linked really in terms of the process of getting the right space, being in the right creative environment for you, whatever that is for anybody who's listening, whether that's floating in the ocean or you know being in nature, whatever it is to get your creative juice flowing start the structure and be open for edit with a muse with somebody else who has uh, alignment have maybe slightly different skill sets but understand you and what the objective is to come out with the program and then get it released get feedback and learn as you go through and the second part pat was then what should we be trying to learn right now in the environment of a really fast-paced change lots of things shifting in every industry and in everybody's walk of life is maybe you've answered it in the course that you've designed. You know, it's this overcoming obstacles. It's how do we build mental toughness? How do we build resilience? Those are some key essential skills to help us deal with what the future holds. As we come to the, the last piece, and it's a question I ask every guest, but I don't give them pre-warning on this one, Pat. And it's around curiosity. And it's when was the last time you did something for the first time and what was it? Oh, I just did something for the first time just last week. For the first time. What was it? Because I remember saying it. I said, I just did this for the first time. When I remember that the last time what, what really stands out in my mind is I learned Miro. Is it Miro or Miro? One or the other. I still don't know how you pronounce it, but uh, go with Miro. I learned, I learned Miro and um, in your course, I mean, I learned a lot for the first time in your course. Like I learned how to do a spreadsheet. Never in my life had I done a spreadsheet. Now I'm doing a heat map. <laughs> but when I, I remember you said in class, we had class on Tuesday, then we had class on Thursday. And on Tuesday, you said, you really, you, I mean, I knew you were talking to me, even though there was everybody else in the class. Because I had no idea. Every time I get on my row, it's like, I go crazy. It's like, it won't move. I can't get it to move. And I see all these people going all over the place and I can't get it to move. And I was working with my partner, Anna, and she said, Pat, just click right there. When you see the, when you see the hand, then it moves. So this, you know, I've finished my Tuesday thing because we had to present again. And then it's like, all right, I got to learn this Miro. I've got to learn this Miro. So I'm up early in the morning, Thursday morning, practicing my Miro. And it's like, I made it work. So that was the, that it was last Thursday. But there was but, something else I did last week. I can't remember for the first time, but I like to try to do something new every single day. Yeah. And for, for many of us, you know, there might be, you know, Miro, it's an online whiteboard uh, tool that allows teams to collaborate in the same space where you can put different things, post-its, comments, you can do dot voting, all sorts of things in there. And these tools where we've maybe had to adapt because we used to do it in person to now doing it virtually, we've got a plethora of software coming up. 
And it can often feel quite daunting when it's a new piece of technology, you know, whether at the moment the prolific AI generation of software that everything's coming out, GPT-4 seems to be powering so many co-pilots, so many apps, it can be overwhelming. And actually just taking a breath, starting through and starting to experiment, starting to have a look at some of these things. And again, have someone else around you. So this balance between some self-directed learning, some videos, you mentioned Anne, uh, having some other people that are maybe just a few handholds ahead in their journey is really useful and helpful when we're approaching something new. So I like everyone to think about what am I just a few handholds ahead of someone else where I can serve? And where is somebody else in my life that's a few handholds ahead than me that can help, you know, me learn in my own journey that I can have that expertise. And I think that's a, a, a nice life where we can have this balance between where are we serving? Where are we learning? Where are we earning? And doing so with a smile. It's been a real pleasure, Pat, to get to know you. I'm excited for our continuing collaboration. And if people have been inspired by some of the courses, some of the things you've been talking about, how do they best get in touch with you? The best way to get in touch with me would be, I'll tell you my website, www.awarenessispower1, the number one, dot com. And if you're interested in our Overcoming Obstacles, click on Online Academy. And Magic. then you can also send me an email, aip at awarenessispower.com. Fantastic. We'll get those linked in the show notes as well. Before we leave, last final piece from you, Pat, is there anything you would have loved to have been asked or loved to have shared that you haven't had a chance to share? I'll give you a moment uh, to reflect on that if there's anything that you want to close us off with. Something that I would have loved to have been asked? Well, I thought you were going to ask me about Bob. Were you going to ask me about Bob? It's a great uh, question. Now, Bob, uh, some of you might have gathered through the conversation, Bob is uh, Pat's late husband. And Pat kindly shared throughout our learning uh, cohort some of the stories uh, about the transitions in her own life of uh, dealing with and overcoming the passing of, of Bob and how that affected your world and your life. And I think um, it's interesting, you know, what you plan and then what shows up. In events you know originally i thought yeah that would be really you know i want to dive into that i want to dive into some of those um pieces but as we've gone through the conversation today pat i think uh, the value that's shown up in your own story and own ways has been remarkable but i'd let's just finish off with a couple of moments about it in terms of uh tell us you know not the you know gory details of somebody's passing but perhaps your own experience of how you reflected on your life and used it to open up a new chapter and maybe some of the key moments in there just to give you an opportunity to share that and for the listeners to uh, maybe learn a little piece through Pat's experience. Well, it was interesting when I started your course, level one, and we started talking about resilience or I in the discussion group, it was all in the discussion group. And I scored like 91% resilience. But when I'm when I was watching you on video and I'm reflecting, I'm looking about resilience, I'm thinking, oh yeah, boy, did I have a flashback? Because when you score low in resilience, it takes a long, long time to recover. And I remember reading, you need some extra help. You need help from somebody else. And it all just, it was a flashback. It's like, yeah, I, once upon a time, I scored really low in resilience when Bob died. It's like, it was, it was horrible. And I remember I said to Father Joe, who you've already heard about, I need some help. And where can I go? Because my father had died 16 months earlier. <clears throat> I can't do this by myself. And he said, you can come to me. We'll go for the first time, come to me, and then we'll figure out where you're going to go. So I went to Joe and I went every single week and I just kept saying, when is this going to get better? When is this going to get better? I cried 
like 12 straight hours, like one day, eight straight hours another day, like three months, I couldn't even get off my couch. I just sat there all day long, couldn't even get into my office for one month. And I kept saying to Joe, when is it going to get better? When is it going to get better? And he said, it will. But he said, just take one day at a time. And I just remember this, what he said one day. I said, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And I remember I was at one, on one side of the table. He was on the other side of the table. And he went like this. He said, here's the table right here. If you can imagine, this is the table where he said, Bob's always going to be with you. He said, he's not going to drop off right here. He said, this happens so that you can help other people. He said, you and Bob have a very successful business, but it's going to take your business to a whole nother level. And he said, and I said, Joe, you know what bothers me the most? He said, what? I said, when people ask me, how are you? I go fine or terrible. And I teach in our personal essence seminar to say something better than great. You've got to be better than great. I always say I'm fabulous. I said, I'm not fabulous right now. I am terrible. And he said, Pat, one day you're going to say I'm good. And one day you're going to say, I'm great. And one day you're going to say, I'm terrific. And one day you're going to say, I'm fabulous. I said, well, I sure don't feel like it. And he said, and if people, if you started to say it right now, people wouldn't believe you anyway. And he said, and when people say, I lost my husband, you're not going to say, oh, I'm sorry. You're going to feel it. You're going to have the empathy. Or I lost my wife, or I lost my son, or I lost my daughter. He said, you're going to a whole nother level because now you can really tap into people. And it, I just kept saying, when is it going to get better? I mean, it was like for three years, I, it was horrible. And then finally, Laura, who was in my seminar in September, and she was also in Overcoming Obstacles. I remember one day I was like 18 degrees outside. All I did was walk. I, I, I would wake up and I'd walk. That, I would walk and pray and cry. And I remember Laura said, Pat, you're the one that told us, what's your goal? I said, I don't have a goal. And she said, but you're the one that told us you got to keep moving forward. You taught us that. I go, well, I don't have a goal. She said, well, what have you always wanted to do? I said, well, ever since I was in second grade, I always wanted to tap dance. She went on the computer just like that. Talk about technology. Talk about being open. She said, call this number and ask if they teach adult tapping. The next day I was in top class. It changed my life, totally changed my life. But I remember five years later, I mean, I'm, I'm still one day at a time, one day at a time, one day at a time. Five years later, I was going on a boat trip and I remember calling my friend Sandy and I was like, I was supposed to meet my friends and I was running the boat all by myself. I didn't have a crew on the boat that day. I was supposed to meet my friends about an hour later. We were going to a big event at the Annapolis Shop Club. And I'm pulling out of the creek. And I'm by myself in this big boat. And I said, I don't know if I can do it. She goes, you can do it, Pat. You can do it. And I will never forget that day. Because all of a sudden, I felt empowered. I'm running this boat. And it's like, yes, Pat, you can do it. It's like I'm running a 47 foot boat motor yacht and I'm going out of the creek and I'm turning, I'm going out into the bay. It's like, I felt, I felt like the sun was shining and the wind was blowing in my face. And I felt like you're empowered. You're never going to be alone. Bob is always with you. He's running the boat with you. You're fine. And that, that was like the turning point. Thank you for sharing that. It, it's interesting, isn't it? Again, this, the word choice we have in our language and uh, when we say we've lost somebody and really it's just a transition to a different part and a transition that they're always there. They're always inside us and they show up in different ways and they can release us to being different versions and at some point empower us forward when the timing is right. And to be, uh, you know, to celebrate being terrible sometimes <laughs> alongside celebrating got the wind in my face the sun is shining and he's with me 
And for many people, I'm sure will be on their journeys that are either have been or to come that is not a lost, but is a transition of people in our lives into different parts and energies of our minds and souls. So thank you, Pat. It's been a real pleasure to hang out today uh, on our podcast, get to know you a bit more, share some of your experience and stories with our listeners. And I look forward to many years of collaboration ahead. Thank you, Ross. I just love being with you. And I'm so excited about our collaboration. And I love your product. And I love you even more. Thanks, Thank you. Pat. Thank you. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalized report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQME assessment. AQAI, transforming the way people, teams and organisations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcast directory and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.